A week ago, we had a discussion period at the Alliance Street House. And the question that came up for discussion was I've been wrestling with this question of what is my responsibility toward other people and what is my responsibility toward myself. I used to take care of other people a lot in the past. A while ago, this person said, but more recently, I've been taking care of my own needs, which were neglected while I took care of others. And now, I'm wondering whether I'm neglecting others. What is my responsibility? This question comes up all the time. Wherever we get together, to bring up problems that bother us. Last fall, in a different country, we had a discussion period, and the first question was, I'm living very well, things are going well for me, but there's this gnawing guilt about not doing anything for others, or enough for others. How is one going to go about looking at such a question and answering it? It is common, isn't it? Do we have to ask at the very outset what am I and who are the others? This person a week ago spoke of her needs and her responsibility to take care of her needs, which included care of two small children. She wasn't very explicit on her needs. She didn't go into that. But what, what are our needs? not the other person's needs, but what are our needs? What do we think of as our needs? This, this talk is not prepared. We're looking at this, we're starting to look at this together. What are my needs? the physiological needs. The blood sugar goes down and one needs to eat. It gets cold outside and one needs to keep warm. It rains outside and one needs shelter. And so forth. 
these needs we all share. There's no difference between these physiological needs of mine and yours, is there? You may live, live in a hot climate and don't have the need for warmth. You may have the need to keep cool. But there are physiological needs for all of us. We are constituted very, very similarly. If I have a family, children, a husband or wife, is there a need to take care of each other? to take care of the children. There may be differences of, of opinion and feeling on this. In the case of the person who spoke last week, there was a felt need to take care of these two children to be there for them. Maybe take them to school, to nursery school, or keep them at home, feed them, be with them. There may be the need to earn money if there is no other income. As in this case, I think it was a single, single mother. She may have to go and work in order to make money to pay for the rent, for the heat, for the clothes, for the food. We share that need to make some money, unless we have money that we have inherited. Does one have preferences? A need to work, a need to have a career outside the home? rather than taking care of the children. One may have no such choice. But if there is income, one may not have to work, but one may need to work in order to fulfill some desire to, to, to be somebody, to be creative, to get along in the world, to get ahead, to be a professional, to help others. Who are the others? In the case of this person, even though she had changed her habits from taking care of other people to being with her own needs as she expressed it, yet there was this need to be responsible for others. What is this feeling of wanting or needing to take care of others? to look at one's own situation, not just talk from theory or principle or idea, but look 
when there is this guilt or gnawing feeling that one should take care or be responsible for others. Where does it come from? Is one truly directly in touch with others? Does one understand other people's needs, other people's situation? Or is there just this urge to, to do something because one is bothered, tormented, disturbed by what one hears or reads or sees about other people? What can we do for others? What can we do for other people's needs? Do we understand each other? profoundly? Do we understand our own needs? Where they come from? The depth of them? Wanting to feel fulfilled, not wanting to feel guilt, not wanting to feel the pain that surrounds one? and therefore wanting to do something, to be done with it, be rid of it? Does one understand one's own pain? The pain of the lack of fulfillment? Is that the motive for helping others? Feeling a lack in oneself? wanting to help others to get away from that ache? Who are the others? Do we know them? Are we in touch with them? Are we in touch with ourselves? Profoundly? Just recently, a letter came to us. It was from UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund. And it said in the letter, in the time it has taken you to open this letter, which was probably 10 seconds, three children have died throughout the world from the effects of malnutrition. Every 10 seconds, three children. That was jarring. And the plea for money, one wanted to take out one's checkbook immediately and write, give some money. What would come of it, of giving this money, one doesn't know. Will it ever reach a child? Will that child not die of the effects of malnutrition? One doesn't know, because there's so many factors involved in helping, in getting aid to where it is needed. Before it gets there, it trickles away. to the hands of people who feel they need that money for themselves. 
or for their political purposes and so forth. And also very recently I read an article in a paper which said that during the past year there were 22 wars going on throughout the world. 22 wars. And every second, it said in that article, mankind throughout the world spends almost two million dollars on armaments everywhere. Armaments to kill. In the face of these statistics, what am I to do? These are not just statistics, these are facts. All one needs to do is turn on the news and there is a story about war or violence or tragedy or sorrow, human sorrow, everywhere. At home and abroad, abroad and at home. How am I going to help these others? Who am I to help these others? What can I do? How, how am I living with my family or friends or alone at work, in the office or in school? In the hospital or wherever one may be in the laboratory. How am I living from moment to moment? Me, who feels this tremendous pressure and guilt and need to be responsible for others, to help others. How am I living? How am I relating to my children? my husband or friend or boss or the people who work with me? Is there continuous conflict, struggle, rush, hurriedness, pressure? irritation. A desire to have one's own way, feeling victimized if one doesn't, anger welling up if things don't go well. Hurt if one is criticized. How are we living each moment? In, in the smallest unit, the smallest human unit, one person relating with another. What, what is our relationship right now? Is one consumed by one's needs and wants and worries and problems? And then wanting out and one way out is to help others so one can forget temporarily about one's own woes. How is one going to help others? 
out of such a motive. How can one be of help if the heart is heavy and closed? If there is this driving need to fulfill oneself, to feel satisfied, coming out of a feeling of wanting and lacking. I'm wondering whether there is any difference between your need and my need. If there is neediness here, how can I take care of yours? with what's going on in myself in all in all openness not trying to get away from it into someone else's problems it's easily easily said, yes, I can, or I would like to, but can one do it? Can it happen? To be in touch with fear and anger and pain, the pain of hurt. Pain of insecurity. What, what is there in oneself is there in others. There is no essential difference between me and you, me and the world, close or far. You and I, he, her, them and us, we're all afraid. And out of that fear comes our need to be secure, to want help, to want support, to want comfort. So we're asking, can one be in touch with that fear in oneself? in all depth, really feel it, really be there with it. And in that be with fear in all human beings, because it's not different in you, him or her, than in myself. children or husband, wife or friends, co-workers. What is our relationship? Can I see you? Can I see my child as you are, as he or she is? Or do I see you? Do we see each other? out of our own needs, our needs coloring our perception of each other, distorting it, wanting the other to be there for me. Is, is it possible to see each other without bringing one's own needs in? Just to see another human being 
exactly as he or she is this moment, without wanting her or him to be otherwise. That's so easily said and so often heard, but is it possible? there, oneself as one is, with someone else as he or she is, without wanting anything, just in touch with each other. If that's possible, that is, that is love. does not fulfill needs and it does not do any harm. It's just there, responding, not for a purpose, just responding to what's there. which means being there completely. Is that possible? I think with regard to three children dying every 10 seconds and 22 wars taking place right now throughout the world, there's very little we can do. We can give money, we can do some political work, but it doesn't seem to have much effect. Maybe a little effect, but we never know, tomorrow things may change for the worse. We don't know. But that is what we're so concerned with, what effect we will have on the world, what my responsibility is toward others who are hungry or needy or in war. What, what is our relationship in the minutest union of human con hum unit of human contact to people? Is there starvation for affection, for care, for seeing each other as one is and understanding each other as one is this instant? Or is there war, adversity, hatred, irritation? Do we see that all the world's problems take place in the smallest u unit, the smallest encounter of human beings, you and me? And if our problems can be solved on that tiny level. They cannot be solved throughout the world. If there cannot be love and affection and understanding and caring and looking and touching what is there in us, between us, how can it be there on any larger level? Do you understand this question? If 
we can't understand anger arising between you and me, see it, understand it, and be done with it, and not carry it over till tomorrow. Leave it tonight. Be done with it. If that can't happen between you and me, how can it happen throughout the world? You and I can't put our defenses down, which means see our defensiveness, which arises instantly the moment somebody attacks us or berates us or puts us down. We can't see these defenses and the hurt that comes from defensiveness and the desire to revenge which comes from hurt, if we don't see that and put it down, be done with it, understand it and let go of it today, not tomorrow. How can we put down armaments and defenses throughout the world? It's the same thing. If it can't happen here, on this minute, essential level, it cannot happen on the global level. But it is, if it happens here, that anger, hurt, the urge to revenge is seen and understood and allowed to drop, then it has already happened on the global level because we're not separate from each other. Anger is anger and revenge is revenge. And understanding is understanding. Universally. And dropping, being done with it, is the end of it. There's no need to carry over any memory of, of anger or hurt, and then there will be no revenge. Then we can meet each other anew, afresh, the next day, maybe the next moment. It's not impossible. So what is my responsibility? That already sounds so divisive and separating. Separative, doesn't it? My responsibility. Just responding, seeing what's there in oneself and in our relationship on the smallest level. Can there be clarity, responding out of clarity? Which means seeing what is so, first of all in myself, not in others. It's much simpler to see something in oneself and not see it in oneself. The same thing. And how do I look into myself? How do I become aware? of what's going on. Just be aware. Just listen inwardly without any particular conviction, prejudice for or against, idea that anger is good or bad. Just listen openly as for the first time to what's happening moment from moment to moment in our relationship with wide eyes and open ears and great vulnerability to feel hurt and pain 
and not immediately act on it, to listen to it, be in touch with it, discover it, meet it, hurt and pain. Are we willing to do that? Or is there no choice but to do it if we are to, to live together with understanding and love? A while ago I read a letter from a man who used to come quite regularly to, for retreat. It was just a short section from a letter. Some of you may have been here. This man received a grant to study and perform music in southern India. Nat the, the, the native music of that particular region near Madras. We hadn't heard from him in a long time. After five months he wrote and said he arrived in the midst of unbelievable heat which affected the body, the body activity noticeably. And he kept watching his tremendous urge to do something, to be busy with something. There was time and space and the heat of the day and night to watch that drive to do something. Just watch it, just be with it, become familiar with it. Without immediately acting upon it. Just be familiar with this whole conditioning which drives us day in and day out, night in and night out, to do things, to be things, to become things, to accomplish things, just to do for the sake of being busy. This hecticness of our life there in this hot spot of southern India, there was opportunity to watch it. And I don't remember his exact words. He said it much better than I can. <coughs> One day just watching some butterflies in the garden, there was suddenly in touchness with a deep source, a deep inner stream, he called it. Which refreshes the heart, he, he wrote. It refreshes the heart. So in, in response to this letter, one of the questions I asked, what about your music? You didn't write anything about that. And here's, here's the response.
you asked about music. Over the last couple of years, there have been, ha, there have been some deep changes in the way this personality organizes itself. And inevitably, those changes operate also as music when one uses that voice. The truth is, I don't even know what music is anymore. When I hear someone play virtuosically, expertly, or sing, as long as that deep inner stream is touched, I'm very happy when I'm playing out of that stream. I'm also happy, but I have lost the ambition and drive to practice. I don't even play every day necessarily. I also don't listen much to recorded music nowadays. I'd rather listen to the birds, the breeze in the leaves, the work crew next door, even the traffic. On the other hand, there are very busy times, particularly here in Madras. I have five concerts in the next two weeks, and it being the musical festival season here this month, I attend two concerts a day sometimes and videotape some of them. But this is very clearly the result of work done before, the logical outcome of previous efforts, and if it dries up, well, it dries up. I just don't feel that old significance attached to it, though when I play there's no thing lackadaisical about it, or is there? So one wonders if, or more properly, when this chapter is going to close. And as the real questioning underneath opens up, the specific question, like all specific questions, is drawn into that wordlessness. And later on, two weeks later, he was sick meanwhile, some of the concerts this month went very nicely. Two were received very favorably in the local papers. People here are just thrilled that someone from so far away should take such a serious interest in their culture. All sorts of speculations arise about one's having been Indian in previous lifetimes, and so forth. They always want to know how it came about. How in the world can I know that? A question keeps coming up. What is the nature of my responsibility to these people? There is no straightforward way to help in the conventional sense, since the problems Indian face are vast and must be solved locally. There is, however, this connection, and I'm aware of how much and how willingly people here share their sometimes very deep insights. Well, this may not be any comprehensive answer, but there's each situation as it arises. Is one completely awake? There's each situation as it arises. Is one completely awake? It's putting it in the, in the briefest possible terms. Each moment as it arises, is one completely awake?
complete listening without needing to do anything because the listening is the doing. Telephone triggers things, doesn't it? <laughs> Happens so rarely, one doesn't have to answer and doesn't need to feel bad about it. <laughs> and yet the, the body is aroused somehow, isn't it? Something is triggered, but one can watch it. One doesn't have to act upon it, just see it. not seeing it. There's no one there. It's just what's there. Without standing outside of it. It's just what's there. A thought arises. How am I to listen this way? I can't listen this way. I should listen. That's just there. These are thoughts which are just there. And another thought, I shouldn't have thoughts. That's more thoughts that are just there. I can do it or I can't do it. That's more thoughts which are there. Like a, a running stream. Without any opposition or resistance, just a running stream of events, thoughts, feelings, emotions, sensations. Is one awake? Is there just listening? Without wanting to get anything out of it? Then there's thought which divides me and what I want to get. But in truth, it's just more thoughts. In truth, there's no division, only thought upon thought, some divisive, some comments. Is that clear? It's very simple. I should, I shouldn't, I can, I can, good or bad. These are all thoughts in one ongoing stream of thoughts and feelings and emotions which are connected with the thoughts. Can there just be awareness of this ever running stream? without opposition, or resistance, or acceptance. Here at the end of the letter, again, a deep gratitude for the time and opportunity to feel all these rhythms and tidal forces, sitting slash not sitting, traveling slash staying, home, sickness, health, noise, quiet, One doesn't know whether the forces themselves are magnified or the attention is more subtle. One doesn't care. As you said, time either flies or it doesn't exist. 
How about that? Please give my regards to friends there. We will end here for tonight. 